Let's go ahead. So I want to first thank everyone. This is kind of an exciting minute or moment in the history of Glacier 2 Medicine Alliance. Um, you think I'm talking about the bill, but actually the exciting moment is this is our first webinar as an organization. Um, it's the small things we have to celebrate in life. So uh, we will celebrate, celebrate that today. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here so you can hopefully, if you are um, watching from home, you can see the Badger 2 Medicine Protection Act slides that I prepared uh, for us this evening. So hopefully you can see those there. I'll make these uh, available to you afterwards in case that's helpful or something that uh, you would like um, to see as well. Go ahead and get started here. So um, tonight, kind of a roadmap where we're gonna go. Um, after a brief introduction here, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, kind of the, the background and the why for this uh, particular Protection Act and protecting the Badger II medicine. Obviously, many of you have been staunch supporters of this effort for a long time, and we're very grateful for that. Um, so some of it will be stuff that you've been intimately involved with and familiar with a lot longer than even I have personally. Um, and But just in case there's others who are uh, just getting up to speed on this amazing place, wanna make sure we have a little bit of context. And then we'll dig into the act a little more specifically and what it does um, and how it'll help protect uh, this amazing landscape. And then we'll finish with a little bit of time about where are we going and how you can help. And then we'll have some time for question and answers um, afterwards. So again, if you're just joining us, um, the Glacier 2 Medicine Alliance, we're a small grassroots uh, conservation organization um, that is based in East Glacier, um, Montana. Got to let some folks in here who have joined us in the waiting room. Hold on one second. Thanks everyone for your patience. Okay. Um, we're a, a grassroots conservation group that's based in East Glacier, Montana. We've been around since the 1980s. We got formed um, initially in response to proposed oil and gas drilling in the area um, and have been really um, reactivated after a little bit of downtime in the 90s for about the last 15 years, focused both on oil and gas and the long-term goal of permanent protection. Um, our mission you, and vision you can read there, but we're fully focused on trying to protect the, the Badger II medicine um, and it's, it's uh, in the surrounding lands, but our primary mission is focused on the Badger II medicine. The photo there on the right, I was pleased to put up there. Uh, that was from last weekend, actually. It's a few of our board members, including our current president in the middle and our vice president, um, both who've been, he was a founder of this effort. They're at the Forks of Badger Creek. And it was the uh, first time some of them have been in there in many years, um, thanks to uh, a longtime member, Frank Vitale, who many of you know, who, um, help pack us in to the headwaters there. One of the, the trips that are, we often host at our fall gathering that uh, if you were there last fall, you may remember Donna's excitement at winning. So that's just a little bit about us. Um, I've been with the Alliance since January of 2019 as their executive director. Um, we'll go on here. So for those of you who um, are interested, the Badger II Medicine, um, is you can see here in a pair of maps on the right it's this area it's most of that area it's actually not there's quite a, a little bit of a line that's off that's uh um sits between glacier national park blackfeet indian reservation and the bob marshall wilderness complex on the left you can see that in in finer relief um and it's this amazing landscape that is as many of you know um, is a one of the wildest places in Montana. It's a, I did my first long trip in there last summer. It was uh, five days and we saw eight grizzly bears and no other people. So a little bit of the character of the landscape. It's a really rich and important fish and wildlife habitat um, for reasons that uh, we'll cover. And as many of you also are aware, it's also a really important cultural landscape. It's been um, home to the Blackfeet people since time immemorial. A uh, place of origin stories, a source of uh, traditional knowledge and um, identity as a distinct people, as well as a place of treaty rights. So those are just some of the values of the Badger. And I want to share as we get started here, um, if I can do this. Um, 
let the people who know the badger best just share a little bit about it. Hopefully this will work for you to hear. Um, so I apologize. It sounds like some people couldn't hear that. Um, so I recommend that you go to the, I'm not sure what the issue was there. I, I, I'm embarrassed that you weren't able to hear it. It's a really beautiful video that we put together. Um, and it was playing quite loudly. So I apologize if you couldn't hear it, but I don't know how to fix that. Um, and I don't want to waste your time trying to fix it. So I encourage you to view the video at your time on our website. Um, it's a nice video that's uh, about two minutes long and it includes a, a variety of uh, um, Blackfeet leaders and tribal members and members of our organization talking about the cultural and ecological values of the Badger to Medicine. Um, so again, my apologies that that didn't work out for you to hear. Um, I wish I knew how to troubleshoot that. Um, But since I don't tonight, we'll move on. Um, so I just want to quickly kind of get us up to speed on how we got to where the bat, where we are today with the Badger 2 medicine as a landscape. Um, as you're probably aware that this area was uh, originally Blackfeet territory prior to, uh, to contact and that it was also part of the reservation that was created both by the 1855 Lane Bowl Treaty and um, and subsequent agreements between the Blackfeet and the federal government. And in 1896, uh, it was part of what was called the Seeded Strip, which now forms the eastern half of Glacier National Park and the Badger Two Medicine all the way south to Birch Creek, which is the northern boundary of Glacier, uh, or of the Bob Marshall Wilderness. And so it passed into federal um, hands at that time and became, uh, was assigned to one of the forest reserves um, later between the Lewis and Clark National Forest. Uh, and we'll kind of jump ahead. It was managed by the Forest Service during that time. Um, and during the intervening period, as there was a lot of um, oppression of traditional Blackfeet culture, religion, and practices, it became an area of, uh, of uh, profound cultural um, refuge where Blackfeet people would uh, go to the mountains to practice both the reserve rights that they had secured in the, in the treaties for hunting and fishing, but also spirituality and other traditional practices. 
And in, uh, although it had always been a, a place of importance, um, it took on that renewed importance due to the loss of other places elsewhere. Uh, in 1974, the Badger II Medicine was officially declared as sacred ground by the Tribal Business Council. Um, at this time, it was um, starting to bear some of the, some of the um, impacts of exploration for oil and gas drilling, um, motorized um, travel, some roads were put into that area. And so it was one of the first times in, 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 in modern recent memory of an attempt to try to protect the area's uh, values. That was followed briefly thereafter in 1976 by an effort to include part of it in what became the Great Bear Wilderness um, area. But most of what we know about the Badger II medicine, at least from a conservation history or perspective, really took place beginning in the 1980s. Um, there had been a proposal to lease the area dating back to the 70s, early 70s, and in 1981, the Reagan administration under uh, James Watt, who was the Department of Interior, um, he leased the entire Rocky Mountain front for oil and gas, including all of the Badger II medicine. There was about 47 leases in total in the Badger II medicine um, that covered basically every acre in the area. And so this was the precipitating event that led to Glacier II Medicine Alliance to form and many other organizations who were protesting the lack of environmental review, um, consultation with the tribe, um, impacts to cultural resources and so forth. And thus began a long journey that we are only today in the final um, moments of that story. Um, a couple highlights I'll hit on that are important for our story. Uh, in 1993, the leases were suspended pending further um, review of impacts to cultural resources and environmental resources. The um, Tribal Historic Preservation Office had started to lead a number of studies that would become instrumental in demonstrating its cultural significance um, in, a, in a way that's uh, discernible to federal policymakers and the, the general public. Um, this was followed um, in with the withdrawal of all leases on the Rocky Mountain front, including the Badger II Medicine in 2006. That was a bipartisan bill uh, sponsored by then Senators Baucus and Senator Burns. And it led to a lot of the oil companies uh, giving up uh, voluntarily their oil and gas leases, um, including some of the biggest one, which came in 2015, which was Devon Energy that had about 15 leases covering um, about a third of the entire Badger II medicine. Um, then as public attention and understanding of the importance and impact of oil and gas to this area grew, um, this led the Obama administration in 2016 and 2017 to cancel the last leases. Of course, as many of you know, two of those leases were challenged in federal court, um, one by Moncrief oil company, which we were able to reach an out-of-court settlement um, with in, in the fall. That was courtesy of the Weiss Foundation and the Wilderness Society were the main leaders on that effort. And then the last one, just this last month, a federal appeals court in DC um, ruled that the lease cancellation was lawful. And uh, as of right now, we are in the process of that order going into effect. And unless the oil company um, pursues further legal um, opportunity, whether appealing to the Supreme Court or petitioning for a rehearing, uh, the Badger II medicine should be free of oil and gas here in about uh, two weeks when that order goes into effect. So it's been a really long journey, nearly 35 years, but due to the leadership of uh, people like John Murray, who's in the black coat on the next to the pole, um, and Glacier Two Medicine Alliance, the Wilderness Society, and many, many other people, both within the tribe and outside the tribe, we've been able to get to this point. And I share this photo because it was a proud moment, exciting moment for me as a young executive director at the organization. We were burning a copy of the Moncrief lease. Some of you may have been there last fall and celebrating the only energy that was ever extracted by a lease in the Badger Two Medicine, which was this paper here. So it was a big moment. Um, so I want to highlight kind of some things the last couple of years that were important that'll help us lay why, why this act and how we got this particular act. Through this process, it was a, a process in the last few years of really building relationships between conservation and, and Blackfeet. Um, and 
through the lease cancellation process and learning to work together to try to find a shared vision for the future of the landscape. And in 2017, Montana was fortunate enough as a state to have a former or former representative Ryan Zinke as Secretary of Interior. And while his legacy in interior was checkered from a conservation perspective, um, one of the things he did was when he was reviewing national monuments that ultimately led to the um, reduction in Bears Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante that is uh, under the Trump administration, is he recommended both at um, Bears Ears and here in Badger Two Medicine that uh, the federal government should look for ways to pursue closer co cooperative management between um, tribal nations and the federal government in areas of cultural importance. And he specifically singled out the Badger Two Medicine and proposed that it be created a national monument. Um, that was his idea. That wasn't, that didn't come from the tribe or from conservation per se, but it set in motion the Tribal Historic Preservation Office, which is um, head by John Murray here, who's the gentleman on, on the right. This is at the Devon Energy Lease Retirement in DC. Um, and Chairman Barnes, who's sitting to the left is Sally Jewell and some of the other leaders behind him there, Chief Earl and Tyson and, and current Chairman Davis and others developing um, kind of their vision for permanent protection and what might it look like. And in this part of this process, um, Glacier Two Medicine Alliance, Montana Wilderness Association, um, hunters and anglers and other citizens um, were involved in helping to um, articulate how that would work for other Montanans and interests on the landscape. And then over the last year, translating that vision into permanent protection uh, legislation. And the reason that we decided to go with legislation ultimately, um, as John likes to say, is in that same document where Zinke proposed a monument, it also led to the, the um, reduction in other national monuments, as many of you are well aware. And so the Antiquities Act, which at times has been used to help protect um, tribal resources and lands, uh, no longer looked like such a good and sure bet to do so. And so legislation was uh, decided upon as a preferred route, which is how we got to the Badger Two Medicine Protection Act. Okay, so I'd like to dig into a little bit more about what the act does and what we're trying to protect here on the landscape and why it's a really exciting um, opportunity for us, uh, both for the Badger Two Medicine and the, the larger um, American public. And I'm going to frame this because this is a GTMA presentation. I'm going to frame it from our organization's goals of what we are hoping to see in permanent protection legislation. Um, and these aren't necessarily ranked per se, but uh, these are kind of four goals that we want to see any legislative proposal. And I think it's a good way to kind of help think about the nuances of what a, 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 a this bill seeks to achieve. Um, and so for us, the one of the first goals was it had to protect the ecological integrity of the landscape. Um, ensure that the Badger Two Medicine would remain undeveloped. Um, there'd be a place that was predominantly dominated by natural processes, fire, succession, migration, disease, weather, so on and so forth. Um, a place where there was native species recovery and abundance, such as grizzly bears and elk and mountain goats and West Slope cutthroat trout. Um, and that these species could continue to move across the landscape. Um, we also recognize though that any protection needed to also protect the cultural integrity of the landscape and ensure that this area could continue to remain a place where black people could continue to practice uh, cultural traditions, um, spirituality, um, continue to connect with the source of their knowledge and origin stories, as well as that it continue to play a role in Blackfeet identity. It's also been an area that has um, dozens and dozens of identified and more unidentified cultural sites, archaeological sites, and so those need to be protected as well. Some, many of which are still in use today. Then we had a couple other goals. We wanted to see uh, that it remain, had to remain open for public recreation, um, quiet backcountry recreation. We wanted to see foot and stock travel, um, you know, consistent with uh, Wilderness Act type designation and opportunities for solitude. And then at the same time, we thought that future management um, should 
include some sort of cooperative management arrangement between the Blackfeet and the U.S. Forest Service, both because this is the respectful and, and right thing to do given the unique relationship between the Blackfeet and this particular landscape um, and the unique knowledge that they bring to understanding this landscape, um, but also as a way of improving management overall um, as both sovereigns hopefully work together in a, in a good way to try to address different management challenges and issues that this landscape may face. Here. So what does the bill do? In large part, the bill uh, is an attempt to try to keep things the way they are on the ground, meaning that what you experience when you go out into the Badger Two Medicine today in terms of this um, wild landscape, um, largely free of human development and uh, signs of human, um, you know, at least modern industrial human use, uh, continues to be what you'll experience next year, 10 years, 20 years uh, down the road. Um, I love this picture here on the right. It's one of my favorite pictures. This is a friend of mine crossing Badger Creek uh, in July of last year, about the 3rd of July in a, in a huge rainstorm. And the first time I ever laid eyes on the Badger was when Lou Bruno, our vice president and founder, took me and a group of students from the University of Montana and we went up to Badger Canyon and we looked into the valley of uh, Badger Creek. And it was just called to me in a really amazing and powerful way, seeing this beautiful creek winding through this forest and this open valley there. Um, reminded me of places I'd seen in Alaska, to be honest with you. And it just felt like this really, you know, from my worldview and experience, this place, it felt powerful and it felt wild and it felt just alluring. And this was the first time I got to go there, which was nearly seven years later, uh, to see it in the first in person. And feeling the power of the river as we crossed time and time again, the amount of moose and, and, and bear sign, uh, it, even though we were only miles from the reservation boundary at this point, it just felt like we could have been a long way from anywhere. And it was a really just neat experience. And so our goal is that people continue to have those types of experiences in the Badger Two Medicine. Um, part of how it does that is it tries to build on existing protections that are already on the landscape, um, either strengthening them by, uh, or making them permanent um, in some way. Many of the existing protections are administrative, uh, meaning that they could change if the Forest Service has a change in policy or there's a change in federal uh, presidential administration, um, or that they're procedural in nature, meaning they're things that the agency has to think about when it's making a decision, but doesn't necessarily have to do anything about, um, if it can provide good reason to do something else. Um, so some of these existing protections are the roadless area conservation rule, which protects about three quarters of the area from future logging and road building under most conditions. Um, it's been designated as a traditional cultural district, um, thanks to the work of John Murray and Maria Zedano who's a researcher at the University of Arizona, um, documenting uh, historic and contemporary Blackfeet use and connections to that landscape. The whole area has been withdrawn from minerals, so there's no future leasing that can happen or um, hard rock mining. And it's been off limits to motorized travel since 2009. And many of these protections that we're working on are also reflected in the 2020 forest plan. And then the third thing it does is it creates this cooperative management framework that we'll get into here in a second. So again, mostly it's trying to take the existing state of, of the world and the Badger Two Medicine and make it um, permanent. So again, looking at our four, our four goals that we had as an organization and how this bill would work, uh, we wanted to protect ecological integrity. Um, and we've done that a couple ways here in this, in this act. Um, first, it's a clear stated purpose of the bill is to protect ecological integrity including fish and wildlife habitat. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's a really critical landscape for a lot of species, one of which um, is, a number, or is a number of threatened and endangered species, such as grizzly bears. It's a secure core habitat. It's also critical habitat for lynx and a last stronghold for genetically pure, or mostly pure cutthroat trout east of the continental divide. So we wanted to make sure that for those species, as well as common species like um, elk, and, and mountain goats that habitat was protected. 
We also want to protect water quality and the free flowing characters of rivers and streams um, in the area. And then it does so by putting a number, what I like to think of as kind of wilderness-like uh, prohibitions on, on road building um, and commercial logging, sets it off use permanently to motorized and mechanized use, which would be the latter, of which would be a, a change. It's currently is open technically to mechanized use, but the, the tribe has asked it to be closed uh, for similar re reasons to motorize is for impacts on, on cultural resources and practices and Glacier 2 Medicine Alliance um, is concerned about uh, impacts on wildland character and um, wildlife and stuff that's sometimes associated with mechanized use. And then it also puts in some prohibitions on new permanent structures with some minor limited exceptions for some administrative things uh, associated with grazing and outfitting and, and trail maintenance and stuff. One thing it does do is it allows um, non-commercial vegetation management, so it can help with some hazardous fuels reduction or wildlife habitat enhancement projects that have a non-commercial uh, component, that don't have any commercial component to them, excuse me. Um, so it limits a lot of the authorities for those of you who are familiar with, with those that, uh, that the Forest Service can use, such as stewardship contracting. And that was, that was by intent, because sometimes those authorities have been used to try to um, do commercial logging and package it as habitat uh, or fuels reduction projects. So it's very narrow on what it would permit. Um, and then it allows continued firefighting under existing authorities. And then it also allows the use of chainsaws. So that's one area it differs from wilderness, but it's like the conservation management areas to the south that were created by the Heritage Act. And a lot of people use that area for, um, for post and pole gathering, either tribal members under treaty rights or others, um, firewood, et cetera, et cetera. And so it was important that we left it open uh, to chainsaws because of that uh, existing practice. So the next thing that the, the bill tries to do is, or seeks to do is protect the cultural integrity. And one of the neat things um, from a conservation perspective is a lot of the, the ecological protections double as cultural protections in terms of maintaining the integrity of the landscape for practice and um, the power of the landscape as experienced by black people. Um, but it also specifically ties the bill to the traditional cultural district and the values and attributes that were identified uh, when it was so designated and ensuring that management is managing in a way that those are maintained or enhanced. And then it ex explicitly protects the ability of the Blackfeet uh, Nation to exercise treaty rights and cultural practices in the area. And then our third goal, public access and backcountry recreation. Um, we also think this bill does a great job of adding to this part of Montana's outdoor uh, heritage and legacy. There is used a lot for hiking and horse packing in particular um, are the two main uses, um, hunting in the fall, particularly in a couple areas. And this would protect um, all of those um, activities. The only change to public access I mentioned earlier would be that it would no longer be uh, open to mechanized um, transport. And then our fourth goal was that it would create some sort of co-management or um, whatever you would like to call it, uh, cooperative management arrangement in which the Blackfeet government is involved on a government to government basis um, with the federal uh, government, in this case, the US Forest Service. And it does so in three distinct ways, um, all of which are uh, done elsewhere and that we pulled together um, in this bill. First, um, following authorities in the 2012 planning rule for forest planning, uh, it provides a distinct role for the Blackfeet in um, helping to craft the management plan for the area as a cooperating, cooperating agency. So something similar to like the Fish and Wildlife Service now, um, for those of you who are familiar with how forest planning works. Um, it also explicitly using that the same planning rule uh, directives incorporates the use of native knowledge um, and so that, that would be considered alongside science uh, and other sources of information in helping to determine some of the, the management. And then the second way that it works is it creates a, a tribal coordinating provision. And this is, a, I think, a really cool, uh, neat part of the bill in that it, um, one of the challenges that we've had in the past that tribal nations have in particular, and federal agencies too for their part, is how to do consultation, which is a federal requirement that is basically communication between tribal governments and federal agencies on different activities that affect um, tribal people and tribal rights and resources. And so this sets up a framework that ensures consultation happens on a certain schedule 
and has a certain purpose to it. And then it also um, ensures that if there were to be any new uses um, under some very narrow sideboards um, in the area um, that would be like say ground disturbing uses such as decision to construct new trails, um, the Blackfeet would uh, have to first give consent before that uh, could go forward. So it actually means that it's not just an advisory role, but they actually, but they say something, it means something, and the Forest Service has to um, work work within that framework and have an, an honest conversation. So we think that's a really good um, part of the framework. And then the third part of the framework is it offers uh, opportunities for Blackfeet to conduct certain management activities that are contracted um, under the Forest Service, uh, such as trail maintenance, vegetation um, management, or interpretive programs that they may want to, Forest Service may want to offer um, in the area. All of these, as other provisions in the in the L, in the Act, are pulled from um, existing legislative provisions that have been used um, elsewhere on our public lands. A couple other things that the bill does. Um, it creates a citizens advisory committee so that the general public has an opportunity, a very tailored opportunity um, to help influence the creation and implementation of the management plan. These are often used and uh, when national monuments or other areas, uh, protected areas are set up as a way to help inform development and management plans to make sure that uh, a broad uh, public interest is represented. Um, and then the bill ensures that all uh, other existing environmental laws um, and opportunities for public participation are remained. So um, any, any activities would still, that require say the National Environmental Policy Act today would still require that in the cultural heritage area in the future. Couple things that Bill doesn't do that are important to point out here. Um, it doesn't transfer land or authority for land. So the, the, the area remains under the jurisdiction and ownership of the federal government and the US Forest Service respectively. It doesn't affect jurisdictions. So fish and wildlife, for example, remain under state or federal jurisdiction. Um, same with civil and criminal jurisdiction. There's no change there. And then all valid and existing rights in the area, um, including uh, tree rights, water rights, um, the uh, outfitter permits, um, grazing leases, all of those are honored and maintained. And so in this case, um, grazing, for example, would continue in the cultural heritage area as it does today. And if for some reason the unspeakable happens and uh, Solomex was to ever get their oil and gas lease back, which they won't do, because we're gonna stop that, prevent that from ever happening, this bill would not have any effect on oil and gas. So just something that's important to point out and understand. Okay, let's go to the next slide here. Um, so I'll highlight some of the outcomes and why we think this is such a win-win bill, both for the public, um, for conservation, and for the Blackfeet. All told when we're done here, um, this act will protect over 130,000 acres of roadless land um, in, in including uh, vital fish and wildlife habitat, uh, we're going to maintain over 60 miles of rivers and streams in basically similar to a wild and scenic rivers designation in terms of effect on protection. Um, we're going to create a continuous protected corridor uh, from Bob, the Bob Marshall Wilderness all the way to Glacier National Park, um, which will finish protecting the last 28 miles of the Rocky Mountain Front. Um, so all told, when we're done here, we'll have 145 miles of the Rocky Mountain Front from south of Augusta all around the Dearborn, all the way up to the Canadian border that are in some sort of continuous protected corridor. It's going to preserve the scenic integrity of the 32 miles of the National the Continental Divide National Scenic Trail. And I think it's going to do that twice, according to my slide. So that's how, that's how exciting the act is. It can do things twice. Um, and then it has some really good outcomes for the Blackfeet as well. Um, it's going to ensure that they continue to, to be able to use the area, that it's not going to be developed in a way that would erode their ability to use it for cultural, religious, or subsistence purposes. Um, it's going to strengthen protections for the traditional cultural district. As I mentioned earlier, uh, this has been in place since 2002, but the district is primary, pr primarily procedural, so the Forest Service simply has to consider impacts when making decisions it doesn't have to actually do anything to mitigate those impacts if they can provide a good reason not to. This is going to strengthen that and so that they'd actually have to ensure that any activities are consistent with protecting that integrity of that district. Uh, in doing so, it's going to safeguard dozens of Blackfeet cultural sites and resources. 
And then I think really importantly, it really creates a, a hopeful and meaningful cooperative management framework um, between the, the Blackfeet and the US Forest Service that respects sovereignty and can provide a better way to ensure that sacred lands are managed um, in a way that's conducive from uh, indigenous perspectives and priorities. Okay, next steps, how do we, how do we, where are we going and, and how can you help? Um, just take a, take a quick aside here. This is a, a photo, I wanna just point something out here. We're looking at Goat Mountain, which is in the heart of the Badger. Just to the left where this one little fir tree is that you maybe you can see if my window is, behind that's the forks of the Badger where that picture was at the beginning. This area is about 20 miles by road and trail inside the uh, proposed cultural heritage area. And where the mouse is right in the middle of this flank is where Chevron was one of the two oil companies that had a lease to drill. And so it gives you an idea of how devastating this could have been to this landscape if roads and oil pads had been built into here and what we have because of the work that's been done. And now we have a chance to ensure that it will be maintain this kind of wild character um, in perpetuity. Uh, it's really an exciting place to arrive at. Okay, so the next step is we need to introduce the bill. Right now we have a proposal. Um, the Blackfeet have put the, the Badger Tree Medicine Protection Act out uh, about uh, just less than a month ago. Um, and we've been out trying to get feedback and trying to rally support. And um, we have a lot of interest from our, our delegation in doing something. Um, but our job is to make it easy for them to do something right now. Um, which means that we need to, you know, uh, call them, contact them, encourage them to introduce the bill so that it feels like the public's behind them and it's not uh, a, a hyper risky thing to be doing. Um, our goal is to try to get it introduced by the August 10th uh, summer recess before um, Congress takes a big break and then the election uh, kind of kicks off in the fall. So we'd like to get into the hopper now. So hopefully we might be able, if we get lucky, we can try to move it along quickly. Um, but at the very least, it, it lines it up better for um, reintroduction uh, in the next session of Congress if we can get it introduced in this one. So that's the next steps is to get this bill actually introduced and turn it from a proposal to where it has, you know, SB and some number after it in its name. Um, and so this is where you come in. Um, and how can you help? Well, as I mentioned the last slide, calling our delegation right now is really important or sending them an email. And there's some brief talking points on our website. Um, but basically just letting them know that you support the Badger 2 Medicine Protection Act and you want them to introduce it. Um, and sharing something of why you think the Badger 2 Medicine is important to be protected is you know, the message that needs to be delivered. Um, other than that, continuing to share with others about what we're trying to do and protect on this landscape. Uh, is really critical in encouraging them to take action. Um, if you want to go a step further, we could use letters of support written to our local paper that help get the word out and show that there's, you know, people who um, behind this from all walks of life here in, in Montana. And I've highlighted some of these ideas um, on our website. Um, there's also a petition there that you can sign if, if you uh, so in, are so inclined that we'll be sending to the delegation to try to demonstrate that support for introduction. And then if you're someone who's really active and understands social media, um, Glacier 2 Medicine Alliance could use your help. So if you wanna help me with uh, some social media work and you kind of see yourself as an influencer in that world, uh, let me know, we can talk offline and I got some ideas on, on how uh, you might be able to, to lend a hand. Um, but there's lots of other ways uh, to help too, uh, but those are the big ones right now. We'll at times, you know, at some point in time when it's safe to do so, hopefully we'll have uh, some rallies and other kind of public gatherings to generate support and, and, and attention. Uh, we're not doing that right now for obvious reasons with the pandemic, um, uh, but we'll need some help with that and some letter writing and stuff as things go forward. So if you have other interest in ways you wanna be in, uh, involved, please uh, reach out to me and uh, I will keep track of that and keep, keep you in contact as we go. So that's gonna bring us uh, to the end of the, the presentation that I put together for today. I'm gonna stop share screen here and see if I can uh, do this effectively. Um, so if you have questions, I think we have about, it uh, looks like 20 some people um, in, in, in the area. Uh, let's go ahead and I'm, I'm gonna, should I, Zach, what do you think? Do you think that 
you have a little more experience with that. If I unmute everyone, we can do questions that way, or should we have them send them to you? Okay, I'm gonna see if I can unmute everybody. We'll see if this works. I think you can unmute yourself now up if you have a question. And um, we'll have a little bit of conversation here. There's about 23 or 24 of us on this website. Um, so if you have a question, just try not to talk over each other and uh, we'll uh, I'll try to answer them best we can for everybody here. And um, we'll go we'll go from there. Okay, I'm having trouble hearing anybody. Any questions? Uh, this is Patty. Uh, hi, Patty. <laughs> How instrumental were the Blackfeet in, in actually writing the bill? Um, very instrumental. Um, the All the ideas and concepts that are in the bill um, were developed uh, either directly um, by Blackfeet or in partnership and dialogue um, with Blackfeet and, and, and other organizations and individuals like uh, Glacier to Madison Alliance. All the language uh, was, uh, was approved on multiple occasions by the Complete Tribal Business Council um, as well. So as well as the, the legal team at, at, at Blackfeet. Thanks. Yep. And, I see and has, oh, has test has Senator Tester shown interest in it, or uh, I know he just introduced a, another bill, but uh, who, um, uh, which of the delegation has shown uh, the most interest, or is this just too early to tell? No, it's, it's not too early to tell. Great question. You know, we've gotten um, a lot of interest from, from, from Senator Tester. He's been kind of a champion on this issue for a number of years now. Um, and really is, you know, wants to do something uh, for Blackfeet and Badger 2 Medicine. Um, we've had some, you know, positive interest from, from Senator Daines as well. So there's some hopeful movement uh, possibly there as well. Um, and I think, uh, you know, the, the only person we haven't seen much feedback from who's been decidedly neutral is Representative Gianforte. Um, how much of that is that he's looking ahead to possibly being governor of Montana rather than legislating right now, it's hard to say. Um, but, you know, I think we're in a good place with the delegation for where we are in this process. Uh, we just need to help keep pushing them forward um, to make it happen. Okay, I'm gonna, there's been a question to unmute the group here. I'm trying to figure out, I thought I had unmuted everybody, but it's not letting me do that for some reason. I apologize to everyone about my limited experience with one of these. I know that's uh, kind of a rookie mistake here. So if you aren't, can't get unmuted, I'm, Zach was trying to help me, but apparently I've somehow precluded his ability to do that as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you want to send me a text, I will uh, try to answer the, the question if you just drop in the chat box, chat box here. The next question I have up um, was from John Bullardson, I apologize if I mispronounced your name. Whose idea was it to have this act? Who will put together the language for the act? Um, so the idea uh, I mentioned earlier um, for the legislation, the decision to go legislatively was uh, uh, led by uh, Blackfeet, but it was a really close conversation um, between a lot of us over what was the best route to go. Um, and all of us were really universal that we wanted to go with legislation because we think it's, you know, it's the most certain way to protect the place uh, long term. Um, obviously, legislation can change, but it's much harder to undo legislation than it is to do, say, uh, a national monument or other sorts of conservation measures that are administrative. Um, the final language for the for the act will be put together um, by whoever sponsors it, their staff, and the Senate Energy Natural Resources Committee. So um, most likely that'll be uh, hopefully Senator Tester 
and you know hopefully Senator Danes will be involved in that too because that means he's decided to sponsor and, 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 and be involved but it'll be the final the final language gets put together there in, in DC um, thank you for that question um, next question was more of a to the group uh, can we get something posted at Summit Trailhead? Anyone in the CD world want to post this on social media? There's been quite a few CDT hikers going through, um, and they didn't know anything about the prog. Uh, it's hard to say if the CD hikers don't know about how they're doing or how the bill's progressing. So if you're connected to the CDT world, please actually reach out to me after this as well, because I'd like to get connected there some as well. And again, I apologize that I can't figure out how to un mute everybody. It's really a bummer. Okay, Laura Lundquist, thank you for the question, Laura. Why aren't you trying for a wilderness? Isn't it just a general awareness about wilderness opposition or is it something else? That is a really great question and I appreciate you flagging that, Laura, because I meant to include that in my presentation. So the Badger 2 medicine has been proposed for wilderness on a number of occasions, um, including what I mentioned back in, in the 1970s and what part of it would have been the Great Bear um, is also included in, in, variation, in variations uh, in the 80s uh, that uh, former Representative Pat Williams and Senator Baucus and others, Melcher carried, uh, I believe in some of those bills. Uh, and it's still part of the NARIPA, for those of you who are familiar with the uh, Northern Rockies and Coastal Protection Act. Um, and, but, we're not going for wilderness for a couple of reasons. The Blackfeet have been opposed to wilderness for designation for this area since the 1970s um, due to concerns about potential impacts to treaty rights. I think the example of Glacier National Park and how that has uh, curtailed rights that they understood were secured um, permanently um, has created general wariness about that potential. And the second is, um, what what they've told me on many occasions when we've had this very conversation is the wilderness acts mindset or orientation where humans are visitors to an area rather than residents of it doesn't doesn't um, blend with how they understand their relationship to the land in their cultural homeland. So the goal here was to divide was to um, design something that Zoom doesn't allow for that. Oh, there's some talking going on here in the background. I don't know who's on. Um, was to design something that provided some of the similar conservation measures, because that was a joint um, agreement on that we wanted to see happen, but was more um, specifically tailored to respect their understanding of their relationship to the land and concern about treaty rights. So hopefully that answers uh, your question there, Laura. Hey, Peter, are we live with our audio now? Oh, you are now, Michael. Yes. Thank you. Well, qu quick question. Um, so you said hopefully getting introduced by August recess. Um, I, given, given the state of the world, is, is there, I mean, most bills seem to take more than one cycle of Congress to pass. Is, is, there, is there any hope that this would move um, uh, in 2020 or is Congress pretty much consumed with COVID and other issues and this would probably need to you know, play out over a couple of years. How, how, what's the thinking on timing for passage and things like that? How does your coalition think about that? Great question. And before I answer it, I think I just found the button I need to check for everyone to allow you to unmute yourself. So please do so with discretion. Um, so to, to Michael's question, what is it, how's the timing play out? Uh, you know, we heard some some conversation that there's possibilities that it could move this session, um, that it could possibly get it, you know, there's enough interest and goodwill around the bill that if we can get it introduced, um, that we could possibly move it through committee and attach it to some sort of savvy, uh, either omnibus conservation measure or must pass kind of uh, COVID package. So part of why we want to get it introduced is if that opportunity was to arise, we would be in a place to be able to move forward um, with the bill. Um, we recognize that often it takes bills several cycles. So we're also in a good place in that if, if we can't move it this year, it allows us at least to do more of the, you know, generate more of the public support and to do some of the work we need to do in Congress to line up the support to pass the bill 
um, in the future. So yeah, there's the possibility there could be some 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 movement this year, um, and I think we want to be in a position to take advantage of that. But there's so much uncertainty right now; it, it's hard to say um, where that opportunity might, in fact, exist. Peter, um, yeah, is like that it. is a copy of that um, petition available on your website? It is. So uh, if you go to our website, it's uh, glacier2medicine.org, and then go over to the Get Involved tab. And at the bottom of the Get Involved the tab, it says Take Action, and that'll take you to our Action Center. You can find our petition there. You can find the phone numbers for the delegation, as well as a link to their email to send them an email. There's some, uh, some help with uh, writing a letter to uh, your local newspaper that's provided there. Um, and also on our website, you can find the text of the act as well as well as some of the background information I provided uh, tonight. That's basically all of the information we had last last fall at the gathering. Um, it's some. It's been it's been, up, it's been updated quite a bit though. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. But I could I could download a copy of that and trot it around for signatures, right? Um, I, talk to me afterwards. I'll get you a good copy for that. Okay. Thank yep. you. Yep. Thank you. Any other questions we have out there? Let's see if there's any other questions in the chat box I may have missed. Yeah, I do have another one. Um, okay, just, please, Elida. Just, just an aside. Um, you mentioned um, bears ears and and those areas and our having um, public input to the, the um, changes here. Was there not um, public input prior to Zinke's running rampant in the South? Not on his uh, National Monument Review that I'm okay. aware of in any kind, no. There was, certainly was a lot of public input that led to Obama's proclamation of Bears Ears in the first place. It's quite an extensive yeah. several yeah. years process, but nothing that I'm aware of that was formalized. I know he did some meetings with county commissioners and other interest groups, okay. but okay. there wasn't any formalized public process that I'm aware of in Bears Ears. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, I have uh, a question here um, from Jim in Michigan. Can non-Montanans help? Great question. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, right now the main thing we need to do is get it introduced. Um, but once we get the bill introduced, we're going to need people from other states and other delegations uh, lining up uh, to help. Uh, it certainly doesn't hurt to call the Montana delegation and let them know that there's people in other states that care about this bill. It doesn't carry as much weight as this someone who's one of their, del their constituents um, calls them, but they certainly will take it into consideration if they're getting phone calls from elsewhere. So you can certainly call the delegation or email them as well if you live out of state. And then as we move on to more of a national stage and are needing to drum up more national support, we will um, need some of the same sorts of letters both to your delegation in your home state, as well as to the sponsors of the bill to ensure that it keeps uh, moving forward. Yeah, thank you. Th thank you. Thank you, Jim, for that question. Anyone else got a question today for us? All right, well, if you do, feel free to, oh, we got, looks like we might have one. I hope we got another thank you. Um, thank you to everybody for being part of this uh, webinar today. Sorry for the little bit of trouble I had with uh, the sound on the video. That's disappointing. It's really good. It's worth your two minutes to go to our website and 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 check out that video at glacier2medicine.org and it's on the um, Protection Act page. You can find it there. Um, thank you for your interest in what we're doing and your support of this work. It's, we can't do it without you. Like this is a huge team lift from people across Montana. It's a huge lift from people around the country who believe um, in protecting public lands, protecting wildlife and clean water and supporting uh, tribal nations in their efforts to protect their cultural resources and sacred places. So 
thank you for being part of that effort and that work. And please call our delegation, let them know you want to see this introduced, tell your friends. And if you want to have questions or talk more, please don't hesitate to reach out to me or for ways that you can help. So thank you so much for being part of this tonight. And we're really glad to have you here.